Welcome to On the Sidelines, the show that usually discusses sports and how sports intersects our lives. However, this series of shows will mostly depart from sports and will center upon an event that is still being discussed long after most sporting events have faded from our memories. Throughout U.S. history, there are dates that are burned into our memories such as December 7th, 1941, and September 11th, 2001. This year, we commemorate the 60th anniversary of another such date, November 22nd, 1963, the day that the 35th President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, was assassinated. Inspired by the book, Where Were You?, that was compiled and edited by Gus Russo and Harry Moses for the 50th anniversary, I wondered what ordinary U.S. citizens were doing on that ever so ordinary Friday before Thanksgiving in 1963 that turned out to be anything but ordinary. For some people, the news of the assassination was received in this manner. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. Vice President Lyndon Johnson has left the hospital in uh, Dallas, but we do not know uh, to where he has proceeded. Uh, Presumably, he will be taking the oath of office shortly and become uh, the 36th president of the United States. But for many Americans, the news would be heard much differently. On the sidelines is so grateful to the current residents of Westboro who remember November 22nd, 1963, and who graciously shared their stories with us. Let us listen to their memories of this event. Okay, we're pleased to welcome the former president of Westboro Savings Bank, who knows this building all too well, (laughs) Joe McDonough. Joe, welcome. Hi, Paul. Thanks for asking me to come in. So let's go back to November 22nd, 1963, in November of 63. What was Joe McDonough doing then, and what do you remember of those times? Uh, Well, Joe McDonough was 18 years old. A few months before November, he had just graduated from high school. And now in November, he's a month or so into his freshman year uh, at the University of Massachusetts. Now, back then, you didn't have to say UMass Amherst because it was the university. And, uh, yeah, so we started our freshman year up there. And, Paul, I don't know where you went to school, but at UMass, part of the tradition was the freshman class uh, would have to wear, men would have to wear beanies. Oh, I So we had the little beanie on the top top of the head. Was that a red beanie? Oh, yeah. yeah. They used maroon. to be the red men back then. Yep, yep. you're right, they were. But yep. it was kind of, it was more maroon than oh, bright, yeah. bright red. Yeah. And it had class of 63 or 60, actually 67 was on the back of it, I think. So how long were you supposed to wear this thing? Just, huh? just for the year. I mean, it pretty <laughs> much, you know, after a few months, yeah. you know, nobody was wearing them. You know, you, you'd get hassled earlier <laughs> in the semester if you didn't have one on. But went away. It was fun time. So on that day, you were wearing the beanie? No. No. You no, no. The, okay. By that point in time, uh, we're in November. Yeah, because we're into November now, yeah. Yeah. So into November, I, I can remember that day, um, I was walking towards Bartlett Hall. Bartlett Hall was the uh, head of the Eng- where the English department was headquartered. So I was headed there for a class. And... Along the way, noticed all of these, you know, small groups of people, and they huddled in, little, you know, nobody yelling or anything, you know, whispering, and you know, maybe some had a radio, and but a lot of heads down, listening, going back and forth, 
I get into the hallway in Bartlett Hall, and I heard someone, you know, raise their voice a little, and it was he was shot. And everybody just started looking at each other. Well, who was shot? Who was shot? And either in that hallway or on the way down the stairs, you know, someone said or I heard that it was Kennedy that had been shot. So now everybody in the building I was in and just about all the buildings in that quarter of the campus were, you know, emptying out. You know, the kids back then, what's going on? And, you know, there was a little anxiety. You know, okay, what, what's happening here? You know, and so, but from all over campus, and you could see it a little bit from where the angle I was coming in at, they were headed down to the center of campus to the student union. Big building. So class was over. If we're not going to class. Oh, no, no, no. Go to class. Classes, you know, yeah. nobody said classes were <laughs> well, over. Yeah. Nobody had to say it. Yeah. But everybody, you know, it was a gathering spot. They'd hold the dances there or rallies or whatever. And, you know, everybody just on it automatically headed for the union. Yeah. And I remember walking in, big, big open foyer. And, you know, for back then, it was a good crowd, you know, I don't know, four or five hundred people oh, wow. in this in this building. Yeah. And there was a second floor and there was a, a balcony. And there were offices around the uh, balcony. balcony. And one of the bal one of the offices up there was the uh, student newspaper, uh, the Collegian. And someone came out of that office, leaned over the railing, and was speaking someone to down on down on the floor, you know, directly to them. And he said, well, this person said, he died. And so everybody just kind of, all right, you know, and it just kind of registered in, but it, it was quiet. People quieted down, and we left. You know, who are you, what are you going to say to who? And what do you do, yeah. What do you do? And the word wasn't out yet, what, what we're going to do. Yeah. So they just headed back up the hill, you know, towards the dormitories. And we were in the dorms, and I'd be honest, I didn't know how the word came out Smoked or got to us. There. But the word did and spread out. Campus was closing down for the next three days. I think the day of the week it was, Paul. You it was on a Friday. On it was a Friday, Friday afternoon. Everyone yeah. in, our, in school was probably getting ready for a good weekend, mm -hmm. which didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So... We got the word, school's closed for three days. Uh, I didn't have a car back then, but uh, somebody in the dorm did, was headed back in the Boston direction. So I got a ride probably down the route at the time, 128, I guess is now 95 now. And, you know, called my folks and, you know, somebody came, picked me up to get me home. And I can remember the next few days, um, you know, being at home, being, again, quiet, nothing going on. Nobody was doing anything. And watching TV and replay, replay, replay oh, yeah. you know, that um, what was going on in Dallas. Uh, I can remember you know, black and white pictures, but now of the uh, First Lady, but I can remember the pink yeah, yeah. Uh, that she wore, and the um, blood spattered uh, all over the front of her dress. Uh, yeah, it, and that that was kind of, I'm pretty sure that was, no, it wasn't live. This was a day afterwards, right, and, yeah. and everybody seen the, has seen the pictures of what went on that day with Lyndon Johnson being sworn in. But one of the pictures, and, you know, I went back and looked when you asked me, you know, to come here, is... Uh, they, I, the picture of John John right. saluting. And yeah, when I looked at that, I said, hmm, yeah, wow, okay, I, I was there. Uh, yeah, that, and, that, and that was pretty much, you know, that, that was that day and, and my immediate reaction to that. And that was, you know, that, that was, that's what happened that day. Yeah, I think people Lock remember that day and it's like, how can this happen? Yeah. It, it, yeah, I don't remember asking that of myself, Paul. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people did say that to themselves. Uh, you know, we were 18-year-old kids. 
And yeah, okay, when's the next party? <laughs> and yeah, we, we, we were sad, uh, but we had three days off from school and we settled down. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that was that. And we, um, I mean, there, there was a lot going on in the country there at that point in time. Right. Uh, thinking about it, obviously, JFK, the assassination, uh, but there was the Vietnam War was going on. Uh, there was civil rights demonstration going on all over the place. And there was Beatlemania. <laughs> yeah, that's true, yeah. That was happening. So it, that was all about the same time. Yeah. First, first, I heard about the Beatles uh, was my, uh, my wife, who was my sweetheart at the time. Still came, is. Still is, still is. And she, uh, she had come up for the weekend, and she was going to school in Boston. I hadn't seen her for a while. And you know, we were talking at one point in time during the evening, and she said, well, you know, the Beatles are going to be in New York. And what I looked at her. <laughs> what are you talking about? And she said, you haven't heard about the Beatles? And I said, no. <laughs> and I, I can remember afterwards, you know, after that weekend, or whatever, being at one of the dances and you know, the band playing the Beatles record or they had a Beatles cover something, band, yeah. something like that. So there, there was a big thing that happened. Uh, personally, you know, in the uh, overall pictures of, you know, 1963 and that time, uh, the Vietnam War was going on. Right. And at the University of Massachusetts, as in, as I recall, all land-grant universities that had, uh, were, in a, at the time, receiving federal funding, had to have ROTC, Reserve Officers Training Corps. Right. And at UMass, it was um, two years mandatory. And after, after those two years, you could make a choice. If you want to stay in and you know, go on and be a regular Army officer, you could. Yeah. If you didn't want to stay in, you, you, yeah. your commitment was up. So I can remember at that time, and it might have even been at the following year, when I had to make that decision, I remember my father saying to me, Joe, you're a lot better off going in as an O2 yeah. as you were as you would be as an E2. Yeah. So we signed up, made the commitment, and we stayed on for a couple of years. And uh, I, I was very fortunate. Uh, back then, my, I had six months worth of training at Fort Knox, and then uh, I was assigned to uh, duty in uh, Schweinfurt, Germany. Wow. And I, what I think happened, Paul, is back then the U.S. Army in its wisdom would send the first half, at one point in time, would send the first half of the alphabet to Vietnam, wow. and the second half of the alphabet so, starting with M.A.C. McDonough. We just made the cut. We went off to Germany. Yeah. And my wife was able to join me, and, and yeah, it was. We had a great eighteen months over there. Got to see a lot of Europe, uh, but I can remember uh, out for a drive on a Sunday afternoon. We're stationed down on the Czech border, and uh, you're driving along a road, and all of a sudden you would see these gigantic signs: "All U.S. personnel turn around now." Because you couldn't travel into Eastern Europe, uh, and uh, I mean we're nowhere as close to Berlin or anything, but Czechoslovakia was an Eastern European point, yeah. country and an ally of the enemies and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so we did a quick U-turn <laughs> and you know, moved out of that situation. But, um, yeah, no, it, it was a great time. I, I've got cheat notes here. Yeah, uh, those are allowed. Yeah. Those, those are all. Um, so another big thing that was going on at that point in time was the um, civil rights mm. movement Very uh, much so. all across the country. And the, the what was the speech? I, I have a dream speech. Martin, Martin Luther, Luther yeah. King was given, I believe, in 1963. In Washington, yeah. Yeah. And the massive, well, I, your audiences have seen the right. pictures of the massive crowd there. And at the time, it, w it was the largest crowd to ever had you know, gathered there on right. the ellipse. It, uh, 
Yeah, you, you remember those times. Uh, but, uh, I'm sorry, Paul, but no, that's fine. I think that's pretty much my story. Uh, Vietnam, civil rights, and JFK. John Kenton, JFK. Those, but that's what was going on in my life and my mind in the mid-60s, 63, 64. Yeah. And I, I think you've cut a, covered it pretty well. Yeah. Well, your memory isn't gone yet, Joe. No, no, no. <laughs> I remembered I had to come today, Paul. <laughs> well, thanks for coming in, Joe. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Okay, we welcome longtime Westboro resident Carol Jolie, Jolly, yes. who is a survivor of the 1953 <laughs> tornado that <laughs> devastated Westboro. Yes. But we're going to jump ahead now yep. 10 years yep. to November 22nd, 1963, yes. and your memories of that time and that period here in Westboro. Yes, well, um, at the time I was um, uh, 30 years old. Uh, living in uh, Marlboro on uh, Brigham Street with my husband and little daughter. And um, uh, that I remember it was a Friday and uh, I had, uh, I was working, at, my husband was a teacher and coach at uh, South High in Framingham. So he was away uh, working and uh, I had done all the chores. I remember it was a Friday and I had done all the, the household chores that one usually would. And uh, I decided it was around noontime and I decided to take a break. Uh, Lisa was in her playpen of playing with her toys and I turned on the TV to see uh, a program. And I remember it was interrupted and they said that the president had been shot. And I said, what, what? I mean, I, I couldn't, what? What did he say? Yes, the president has been shot. He's in a motorcade in Dallas at, on a um, pre-election uh, tour, campaign tour, um, and he, uh, he's been shot. And, and uh, then came up an image. Uh, it, it was a series of images, I recall, um, of uh, Jacqueline Kennedy trying to get out of the car, and, and the president slumped over, and Governor uh, Connolly uh, next to her, and he had been shot as well. And then I remember uh, all the confusion and and uh, the car speeding off. Uh, the well, the, so, the the security fellow who was walking behind the car tried to help her to stay into the car. And then the car sped off, and they said it was going to. Uh, I think it was Parkland, Parkland yeah, Parkland, Parkland Hospital, which was the nearest one. And then uh, I just was stunned. And um, so I remained glued to the TV and and then uh, uh, programming went on. And, and uh, then I remember Walter Cronkite, I believe it was, came on and said uh, that after they showed some of the confusion at the hospital, uh, on the outside, waiting news that the president had died. And uh, it was just uh, totally overwhelming. Uh, then uh, time went on and uh, everyone discussing this, what could have happened, where did the shot come from, the, the knoll and the, and the uh, book repository uh, on the up, one of the upper floors, uh, a window there was suspect and then, um, uh, I think, I believe it was, uh, Don came home about that time, uh, and, and I don't know if he had known before, but we were both sitting there and glued to the TV, just totally shocked. And um, then the next uh, vignette I remember was uh, in Air Force One. Uh, they had brought his body aboard uh, the plane to fly back to Washington, and uh, uh, there was Jacqueline uh, to to the right with the president's blood on her beautiful jacket, and um, and and then uh, LBJ standing there with his hand on the Bible. I believe it was a judge that they had uh, 
uh, found a local judge to administer the oath of office, and uh, uh, and and that that took place, and then uh, the camera went off again, and uh, they obviously uh, flew back to Washington from then, but uh, it it was totally stunning, and I thought that night when I went to bed, good grief, this morning we woke up with one president and tonight we go to bed with another president and I thought, wow, it is very important uh, to think about who the vice president is when you, when you go to an election. And I couldn't help but now think think in terms of our election coming up mm -hmm. that we really need to think of both because mm -hmm. we saw that happen in a flash yeah. yeah it was just just remarkable well i want to thank you for those memories 60 years ago but in some that, case that, it was it a seems long like time ago but it, but it like seems yesterday. like yesterday and then yeah. on through the weekend yeah. uh the the um uh, the the child saluting his father right. as the as the caisson went by with the riderless horse, right. and then the uh, uh, dignitaries uh, of the uh, uh, all of the uh, officials in our government, uh, and many people, millions and thousands of people, uh, viewing the um, uh, his coffin at the. Uh, uh, Capital, right. and then the uh, funeral, and so forth. But also the uh, drama of the uh, uh, killing of uh, Lee Harvey Oswald when they brought him in with uh, the uh, uh, bar owner uh, Jack Ruby. Jack yeah. Ruby, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, and then we thought, what next? You know, you didn't want to know. Yeah, I, I mean, it was just. The whole time was just overwhelming and stunning. And Dawn, uh, when this, uh, JFK was a senator, uh, he was at uh, some occasion and had a chance to meet him and shake his hand. And I remember he said he was just such a charismatic, uh, really outstanding person. Yeah. And he was. He was, yeah. Yeah, remarkable. Okay, well, thanks again. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Welcome to Vinnie Aquilino, who had a career with the U.S. Navy Department and the United States government. But back in 1963, Vinnie, you weren't there. What was going on in November or thereabouts in 1963, particularly November 22nd, and the events thereof? Well, I was in high school. Uh, our town, Mount Vernon, New York, uh, just uh, built a brand new school a single school for the town. It used to have two high schools. And so we were the first comprehensive high school in Mount Vernon, and we were the first class, we were sophomores, I was a sophomore at that time, to go all the way through uh, Mount Vernon uh, High School. Um, yeah, we were young and we were happy, and uh, you know how <laughs> that works. Uh, John Kennedy was elected in 60. And uh, he, in his uh, acceptance speech, uh, talked about the torch being passed to a new generation of Americans. And we all felt, all my classmates felt that he was talking to us. Well, I think people our age. Yeah, it was the right age now. of Camelot. We right. believed that. We, we saw all things fresh and new. Well, looking back, maybe it was. Uh, <laughs> funny you should say that. So that's what was happening. Of course, then, if you want to talk about November, um, it was just after the lunch, you know. I think he was shot 1 o'clock or 12 o'clock in uh, Texas time, Central time. It was 1 o'clock our time. We had just gotten back to our class from uh, lunch. And a uh, brand new school had working intercoms. And they announced that, uh, and I was just happened to go be going by it to my seat when the announcement was made. Now, so I was. Like, do you remember what class it was? Now you're pushing. I'm it, pushing buddy. a little bit. But oh imagine if it was history. But I anyway, can't say that. Can't say that. Okay, I we'll can, let that go. I don't go. know what that. Is. Yeah. 
But um, I was two feet from that thing, and he said that John F. Kennedy was shot and killed. And uh, the air went out of the room. Now, you, you were know, all soft, it was all sophomores. In we were all sophomores, yeah. yeah that and was just a sophomore class. Boom, yeah. Boom. It was crying and all that. You know, it was just horrible. This Camelot, this prince and his princess Jackie, you know, were, were ours. Were our, so that's what happened. I know exactly where I was. And, and were you dismissed from school? Do you have any thoughts on what happened? No, I believe that we uh, muddled through the day, you know, much like people muddled through uh, the recent tragedies we've had. So, uh, and then, of course, TV was the medium, and it was 24 hours of uh, funerals and problems. It was probably the first time that the media coverage had such a big news event that everybody, everybody watched. You're right. You're absolutely right. And um, I, I think the other thing that I remember is when Armstrong stepped foot on the moon, it was kind of that level and that kind of coverage, 24 hours coverage. Uh, that's where you went to get educated. Now, John F. Kennedy, of course, was from Massachusetts and was a Democrat. New York, how did New York feel about it? Well, you know, I come Democrat. from a union family. My yeah. grandfather was a union delegate. My father was a, a union man at first and then went into his own business building. So we were all Democrats. You know, I remember in kindergarten when, um, uh, what you call it, uh, was running against uh, oh, so Eisenhower. Adlai Ad Ad Stevenson, yeah. Yeah, Stephen Adlai Stevenson. As a fifth, as a kindergarten, I was rooting for Adelaide. And, uh, you know, st disappointment started early. But then, uh, you know, in comes John Kennedy after Ike. And, uh, you know, we're talking about a new generation. And we thought, yep, it's it, going to happen. It's it, going to start happening. It was All new, the energy was there. It was a new frontier. Yeah, the new frontier, exactly. All right, Vinny, well, thank you very much. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Welcome to Jim Tepper, the chairman of the Westboro Veterans Committee here in Westboro. And we're going to go back, though, 60 years to November 22nd, 1963. What was Jim Tepper up to in November 63? Well, that was well before my birth, Paul. Yeah, okay. so, well, well, we'll try it anyway. <laughs> um, November of 63, I was a freshman at Springfield College, um, which is in Springfield, Mass., mm -hmm. a lot of people know. And I remember being in the student union with a group of other students, and the announcement came somehow to the group of us, and we gathered around and started listening to the news. Um, in those days, we didn't have the social media, personal TVs uh, that society has today. Um, so it was like word permeated, somehow word just it, permeated. It came somehow. down from yeah. this, and of course yeah. the student union probably had more connection to right. communication than, than if we were in the gymnasium or if we were in a... So were you having lunch or studying? Oh, well, I must have been studying. I, see. Cause I, <laughs> I, see. <laughs> I, I, I generally skipped lunch uh, well, to, so I could get I, extra I, studying. I in. understand, yeah. That's what I used to tell my folks anyways. Um, I, it probably... Neither. Probably in between classes, I, I having see. a coffee, right. getting a snack or something of that right. nature. They had recreation room with pool table, ping pong. Our mailboxes were there. That was back when you had a personal mailbox and you went to the student union, opened it up, took out maybe a check from mom or something <laughs> like that. But, um, so I don't remember what mm -hmm. I was doing now. Right. But, uh, and we buzzed around for a while. It was very shortly thereafter. Uh, word came that the campus was shutting down uh, and we had to go home. So um, I was there without a car. Uh, and I can't honestly tell you who I got home with, but I know that I 
chum to ride with somebody that was going north. I lived in Northampton, 20 miles to the north of Springfield. So were you a commuter or? No, no, I was living on campus. But you, but it was shut down. You, it was everybody out of here. That's right. Wow. Well, when I say everybody, yeah, but I, I can't speak for some of the folks that might have been at great distance. Right. I don't know that they locked the dormitories right. and shut off the cafeterias, but certainly the local folks packed up and went home. They were canceling classes. As we know, that was two days, three days before Thanksgiving. I'm trying to recall now. Right. It was, it was on a Friday, and Thanksgiving was the next Thursday. That's so right. you would have been coming into Thanksgiving week anyway. Right. And we only had a couple of days of classes right. the next week. Right. Um, so we went home, and I remember getting home, my siblings uh, being there, along with my parents, although my dad still had a retail store that he ran in Northampton, that was open. And we just gathered around the small TV that we had uh, and started watching, and it was just nonstop watching the events uh, as they unfolded, the new news that came in, and the transportation, and the swearing in. Um, the black and white TV? No. Black and white TV. Well, do you remember if your father closed his store or? No, he did not. He did not? No. No. But the rest of the family, it was all. The rest of the family. My well, mother a heck was of a, a way for a family to get together. Yeah, but. my mother was a teacher. My brother was an administrator over at UMass. My younger sister was still in high school. Mm-hmm. Trying to think about what my older sister was doing, but she eventually came back to the house, I believe. So, you gathered around the TV, and that just, took care of the weekend. Week, Everyone week. was ready for Thanksgiving weekend. It was the weekend right through. It was amazing. I, I'm trying to recall. I should have done some homework. You'll know this better than I. <laughs> when did they televise the the, the case on and the whole activity in DC? Was it Tuesday or Wednesday that of that next week? Would have been probably the Monday or the Tuesday. I don't yeah. I don't remember myself. Yeah. But again, that was all. It was breaking news and something I think new to us for television, our age, that they actually televised all this. Oh, yeah. I mean, because you, you didn't have the methods of communication that we have now. No. And all of a sudden, TV was, it was num prime. number one. It, it was, was number one. There's no question about that. Yeah. Um, we had, um, clearly, we weren't glued 24 hours right. to the TV, so we'd go off and you'd gather with some other friends and right. you'd talk about the same thing. And how does this happen? And then the conspiracy theories began right. to pop up quickly. And what happened? Um, who knows where the truth is in any of those stories. Right. But um, there were some kids that just let it go right across the top of their head. Good, I got time off. I don't have to do anything, you know? Well, uh. Uh, I'm sure there's a little piece in the many of us that said, all right, we got to stop what we're doing and decide. I mean, I, to, to a degree, liken that to stopping the world as we did during the blizzard of 78. Right. Uh, we may have chatted offline. As you know, right. I spent a week flying around uh, the Commonwealth pulling people out of snowdrifts in the right. 78 blizzard. But that was everything was just stopped as well, at least right. in the eastern part of the state. Yeah, it was like somebody blew a whistle and... You just stopped. This ordinary day is not ordinary anymore. That's right. So something's uh, happening. Uh, you know, well, we, unfortunately, we, can, we just celebrated a, an event that mm. made us do the same thing. So right. those aren't the kinds of things that you like to stop the world for. No, but you do remember. You do remember, there's no question. I wish I remembered more of 1963, but... Right. Well, I am glad that you remembered to come down. So I want, to, I want to thank you for coming down and sharing the memories that you have. Well, I thank you for that. I do. Thank you for what you're doing. You're, oh, this is a great, this is a great event. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. Thank you. We welcome Butch Bird, businessman for many years, but in 1963, I don't think you were a businessman. What was going on in no. November of 63, Butch? Um, I was a junior at Boston University and um, living life like any young person, very, sometimes very carelessly, but uh, having a good time. Now, how did you end up at BU? What, what, what got you to BU? Um, well, let's say uh, I had a pretty good high school career, and a, a number of colleges have approached me 
uh, giving me a scholarship uh, for my football talent. For football, yeah. And uh, but most of them were from um, Division Two um, football programs, and I wanted a Division One. Now I did uh, have a preference. I wanted to go either Syracuse or Penn State. And neither one of those schools said I was good enough to play for them. But those so, were Division One, One, One. They were they were really up there, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, so BU came along and said uh, we want you, and I said okay. So we were in we were a, uh, we were in college, and I don't know we come November. John Kennedy, of course, was Massachusetts. You were originally oh. from New York, but yeah. John Kennedy here we had the president of the United States from Massachusetts. So Massachusetts was kind of like pumped up having a president. You come down to Massachusetts, um, maybe not knowing who John Kennedy was, maybe you did. Uh, and then all of a sudden, November 22nd comes. And do you remember what was going on at BU at that time? With well, you? let me answer that. But um, coming from New York, I didn't know anything about uh, Massachusetts politics or John F. Kennedy. But as soon as I got here, he being very popular at the time, um, I soon understood uh, the relationships and became an admirer, as many other millions of people did, of JFK. But uh, again, um, I still was young and naive, so I wasn't really aware of what this government stuff was all about. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to play football and go to college. And so do you remember when, shot, when John was shot, where you were or any, yeah. what it was like at life at the university, maybe before that day or after that day or what happened? Well, that day, yeah. <clears throat> I was walking up, uh, I just finished classes for early afternoon and I was walking up uh, Commonwealth Avenue and uh, going into the uh, cafeteria, BU's cafeteria, where a couple of my friends were waiting for me. I walked in and they said, um, did you hear? The president's been shot. And that completely went over my head. I thought, the president of, what president? Uh, or then President Case, who was the oh, president of BU, BU at the time, yeah. came to my mind. I said, President Case? And they said, no, no, the president. I'm still thinking, well, what the hell are they talking about? <laughs> Doesn't register. And then yeah. a young lady came in. She says, President Kennedy has been shot. I said, oh, wow, that's... So we all got up, everyone thinking their, their thoughts, their initial thoughts. And I'm just wondering, walking out of the cafeteria, how could something like this happen? here in the United States. At this point in time, yeah. yeah. It, it didn't make sense to me. So we walked around and then it really started to hit me when people, strangers walking down Commonwealth Avenue were tearing up, crying. And just people I didn't know uh, would stop and say, did you hear? The president's been shot and just bursting in tears. And I said uh, to myself, I, I can't believe this. But the, the, the impact, the major impact about JFK being shot didn't happen until days or weeks later with the com complete running of what happened. The, the limousine going down that Texas highway, uh, Jackie, his wife, in the back seat, and it was run over and over and over. So you couldn't help but, you know, get feeling jarred every time. Well, I couldn't help feeling jarred every time I saw that. Um, it was tragic. The uh, later on, you'd play for the Buffalo Bills, and the uh, on that Sunday, the commissioner of the NFL said, "We're going to play the games." And it was a, he said it was his worst decision he ever made. And when the Dallas Cowboys went to Cleveland, they were told, don't you tell anyone you're from Dallas or play for the Cowboys. Mm. And when they played the game, they were booed heavily. I mean, the, the, their emotions were rampant. 
And then the, uh, but besides that, at that time, the Philadelphia Eagles were playing the Washington Redskins in Philly. And Sonny Jurgensen, who was the quarterback, said, we don't want to play because he was the NFL. And of course they played and they took up a collection and they didn't know what to do with it, and they eventually gave it to J.D. Tippett's widow, the, the police officer that was was killed. You were at BU playing football. Was the season over, or do you remember if you were going to play? the Because the, Saturday would have been the next day. Yeah. You have, do you remember if... That game was canceled. That They did cancel that game. Yeah. Uh, that was the uh, BC game, which was our trip. Oh, that would have. I went to Holy Cross, but BC would have been a big <laughs> rival, yeah. Yeah, that was our traditional last game of the oh, season. Oh, that was the trick for you, yeah? And uh, that was canceled. And, and it was not re rescheduled? No. So we'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> well, B, B, BC had a real good football team, and we weren't so talented. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I, I probably. Would have lost, but anyway. Well, BC, BU gave you a pretty good uh, foothold to, to go on to your uh, professional <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. life after that. For sure. Yeah. Well, Butch, I want to thank you for coming on the sidelines and thank you for your memories. Thanks for coming on. Well, a pleasure being here, and um, we'll do it again sometime. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. That concludes part two of our five-part series, Westboro Remembers, November 22nd, 1963. I hope that you will join us for the remaining parts and more memories from the people of Westboro. Until then, this is Paul McGrath saying thanks for watching, and I hope to see you at the game, and if you are not playing in the game, I hope to see you on the sidelines. Mm -hmm.